Um, so with that, um, I will continue on with our event. I'm going to be sending out the survey in a little bit. Um, so we also want to make sure that you do it and you challenge your friends and family to do it as well. Um, we would love to see your faces. So if you have your camera off, if you can, please turn it on. Um, it would be very helpful to make this as lively as possible. Um, today's format uh, is that we're going to start off with Muhammad, um, who's going to start off speaking, and then afterwards, Alex will be following him. We'll then take a question and answer session. Um, we ask that you put your questions in the chat, and then I'm going to be going in order of the questions that were received. Um, and now, to introduce our wonderful guest of honor. Um, Hamid Nabusi is an attorney and community organizer based out of Houston, Texas. He is currently serving on the board of the Palestinian American Cultural Center um, in Houston, Texas, and is vice general coordinator of the Palestinian Youth Movement. Mohammed first became involved in Palestine work during his undergraduate and law school years at the University of Texas at Austin, where he helped lead a divestment campaign targeting corporations complicit in the Zionist occupation of Palestine. Following his time on campus, Mohammed has spent the last few years working to empower the Palestinian and Arabic community of Houston and strengthening the roles of students and youth in the Palestinian community and struggle more broadly. I had the pleasure of talking to Mohammed a couple weeks ago and he's truly a gem for our community. Um, next is Alex, Alex Saleh, um, who is an undergraduate sophomore at Sam Houston State University, where he is pursuing a dual degree in political science and theater with a minor in Middle Eastern studies. His research interests focus on the role of cultural production as a tool for political mobilizing in the Arab world post-1967. As a Palestinian, Alex's dedication to social justice is grounded by an unwavering commitment to the liberation of the Palestinian people and all those struggling without, against colonialism and imperialism. Alex works closely with a number of organizations that engage with transnational movement building and amplification of Palestinian demands for freedom and liberation, of them being Students for Justice in Palestine and the Palestinian Youth Movement. At Sam Houston, Alex serves as an ambassador to the Middle Eastern Studies Department. In his free time, Alex enjoys listening to music, reading, and hanging out with friends. Without further ado, Mohammed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rania, and um, thank you for organizing this event. And I'm so happy and honored to be here joining uh, PAC New Jersey. Um, and thank you for all of you who are in attendance. Um, it's really uh, great to have this opportunity to share some words with you. Uh, I just want to briefly uh, give some background on who I am. Um, uh, as Rania said, my name is Mohammed Nabilsi. I'm an organizer based out of Houston. Um, I came up as a student and youth organizer, and so Really, I'm speaking to those experiences, but like many of you, my first experiences with any sort of Palestinian activities came when I was very young and my parents would take me hand in hand to protests. So I can remember very early on um, being at protests, looking at the guy who's sitting on somebody's shoulders chanting and thinking, I wish I was the person that was on his shoulders. Um, but now I guess I get to be that person um, or play a similar role. And so I'm excited to share with you all about a little bit about the history of Palestinian student and youth work, uh, both in Palestine, really globally, and in the US. It's going to be a brief discussion of it just to give you all some context. And then I'm going to talk to you all about the role of students and, and youth, why uh, this category of people are, is really important and critical for our struggle and, and, and for forwarding our struggle. So um, I'm with the Palestinian Youth Movement. I'm the Vice General Coordinator of the Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, I'm also on the board of a PAC. Uh, the, it's a similar to the PAC that exists in New Jersey. Uh, it's a community-centered uh, organization. Um, and so I have the, the fortune of being on both sides of the, the terrain. I'm one foot on campus, one foot with youth, but also one foot in the community, really engaging with different generations. Um, the PYM specifically, which is what I want to talk to you all about today, is a, it's a transnational grassroots organization that's dedicated to bringing youth, like many of the people here in attendance, back into our struggle. Um, a lot of the times, because we exist in the diaspora, we lose our connections to our struggle. And what we're doing is bringing you all back in, bringing us in so that we can advocate for our struggle and so that we have a, a sense of uh, responsibility towards uh, advocating for our people. Um, the PYM en engages in a, in a wide range of activities, um, but really um, the goal is about rebuilding our institutions and our participation in our struggle. And so we do communal work, we do BDS initiatives with local grocers, 
Uh, we've been doing COVID response work, relief work, such as what PAC New Jersey has been doing. We do cultural and educational programming. Uh, we have a, a scholarship that's called the Hassan Kanafani Resistance Art Scholarship that uh, actually was um, the, the um, more, most recent launch was this past June 1st uh, for submission. So if you're an artist interested in submitting your work, we have a cash prize for the first, second, and third place winners. And we actually print an anthology that I have right here with me so that you can see. This is the Hassan Kanafani Resistance Art, Art Scholarship. It's a beautiful anthology of Palestinian and Arab artists across the um, uh, states, uh, North America, really. And so we're, you can see from the pages that a lot of amazing work in it. So I just wanted to plug it real quick. If you're an artist, you can find out more information about it on our website at pymusa.com. Uh, but we also engage in different other different programming around student empowerment, supporting students on campus, building sustainable work on our campus because of the four year turnaround that a lot of you experience. We're also engaged in a lot of joint struggle work. Uh, a lot of our chapters across the US have been, and in North, really North America and Canada have been uh, organizing contingents, basically delegations to the George Floyd protest, the Black Lives Matter protests that have been happening. Um, and so PYM is really doing all kinds of work and I really encourage you to check us out. I'm going to put up a slide at the end of our presentation that talks a lot more about it and uh, so I won't spend too much time with it. So now what I what I really want to do is talk to you briefly about the history of student and youth work. Um, following the Nakba in, in 1948, uh, what the Palestinian society experienced was um, obviously a catastrophe. But what that meant specifically was the um, governing bodies that we voiced our opinions through as a people were dissolved. Our society was destroyed. Our people were spread across the globe. And so the various vehicles and mechanisms that we could use to advocate for ourselves and, adv and, and forward our struggle against Zionism and colonialism were gone, okay, or did not exist in the same way. And for a number of years, there weren't any institutions in the diaspora that were really speaking for us as people. Um, and that's when really there was a critical moment in the late 1950s following the Nakba that we started to see Palestinian youth, really Palestinian students on their campuses in the surrounding Arab states, specifically in uh, Egypt and Lebanon, start to organize themselves. And they started to do things like commemorating events uh, in our history, um, advocating for our st struggle, doing cultural programming, a lot of the things that youth like us do now, okay, and our institutions do now. And specifically, um, if in 1959, uh, what we saw was the establishment of the University of Cairo Palestinian Student Association. And What's really noteworthy in this is the, the president of the student association. It would eventually become the General Union of Palestinian Students. The president was Yasser Arafat. So Yasser Arafat actually got his start as a student organizer. His vice president was Abu, Ye Abu Iyad, who was also then the second in command in terms of Fatah. Okay. And the same way in Beirut and, and in Lebanon, the Palestinian factions like George Habas uh, or Wadi Haddad, some of the members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, they started working at campuses in Lebanon. And so their experiences and our movement, the National Liberation Movement that was eventually birthed when we launched the revolution in 1965 with the PLO, was something that started on campuses, on college campuses in the surrounding states. So it's not too strange that youth who come together for a focused period of time and exploring our struggles eventually become the leadership that then carries our struggle forward. And so what we need to understand as youth and as students is that we are the inheritors of struggles and we're the ones who carry it forward. And we're the ones who then assume leadership. And so just like Yasser Arafat or George Habash eventually became major figures on our struggle, our youth today and students today, whether in Palestine or around the globe, will be that too. And so at one point or another, the, the different student organizations, especially with the launching of the PLO, became, uh, under, came to be under one banner, and that was the General Union of Palestinian Students. 
up until Oslo, there were chapters of general of GUPS across the globe. Uh, one of the remaining chapters in the U.S. is actually in San Francisco at San Francisco State University. But at one point or another, there was chapters across the U.S. And if you talk to the elders within your communities, if you go and speak to some of the people who sit on these boards, and they'll tell you they were members of GUPS, that they were organizers with GUPS, that we were, they were doing similar activities to what we were doing on our, what we do on our campuses today. And so GUPS was a vehicle where Palestinians could come together and, and forward our struggle and to engage our communities. These same members of GUPS went on to create other institutions, institutions like PAC New Jersey or like PAC Houston. If you talk to a lot of the PAC Houston members who are older in age, they'll tell you they were GUPS students. They were GUPS members in, in, uh, in advocating for our struggle on campus. So why youth or students? What's the significance of being a youth, a, a person who is young in age, or being a student, someone who is located on a campus? Um, youth and students represent a large segment of our, of our society. Uh, they are in specific moments in their lives where they're transforming as people, beginning to le learn new things, exploring new ideas, and exploring themselves as people. This is one of the few moments in our lives where we're on campus or as young people really discovering our identities as people. This is where we formulate our beliefs, our values, our priorities, the things that we want in our life, okay? Because we are this category, we are also a, a, a group of people who start to look forward in terms of what we want to change in our world. And we start to think about the ways that we think that our societies should be governed. We start to think about the ways that we want to direct our movements. And as I said a moment ago, we're also the people who eventually become the leadership in our communities. We're the ones who become the politicians, the professionals, the workers within our society, and we carry our values, our beliefs, our principles into those areas. And so if you think about the work that we're doing on campus or with, with youth, whether in high school or in, elsewhere, we're intervening as Palestinian organizers at critical moments in their lives with youth. And that intervention is an, inventor, in a, an intervention that is calling for justice for our people. That's why when you look at, for example, some of the emerging movements, like If Not Now or Jewish Voice for Peace, a lot of those people encountered Palestinian youth, Palestinian organizers, who intervened in their lives at specific junctures and allowed them to see what has otherwise been hidden. Okay? Those interventions, those same people that are exposed to us on campuses or in high schools or in our community, then carry those values and carry those principles forward. And now you can see, for example, in groups like If Not Now, the, the Jewish organization that's pushing the Jewish community on, on its support for the occupation and Zionism, these are the same people who are now leading the charge within their communities for change. And so just as we carry the flag, the banner of Palestine and the banner of justice, now youth elsewhere are doing the same thing. You can see that in the Black Lives Matter protest. If you go into the BLM protest and you look around, the vast majority of people you're going to see are going to be young people. The people who are carrying the banners on their campuses, pushing for divestment from, uh, from the prison industrial complex, those are youth, okay? And this means then, as a category of people, as a, uh, a class of people in our society, we are positioned in a very particular way to be able to influence and change our world. We are changing our world for the future. Our impact isn't necessarily gonna be now, though it can be. Our impact is much greater felt for the future. In the same way that Yasser Arafat in 1959 was the president of the Palestinian Student Association at the University of Cairo, only to begin become the chairman of the, Palest uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization demonstrates the capacity of youth to be the change for the future. So what is the role of youth and students? And I'll let Alex focus on the ways that students can engage politically uh, on our campuses. But what I wanna talk to you briefly about is what is our role as youth and students? Uh, youth and students are, as I said, the people, a class of people who will carry the torch. They must engage in work at an early age. 
This is where youth and students develop values, skills, experiences, networks, and connection. Youth and students also tend to be more forward thinking and open minded. They should act to push communities towards different ways of approaching our world and our obstacles. They have the space to test new ideas, new structures, new approaches. And we see this in the way that, for example, youth now who have entered into, for example, the Bernie Sanders movement, the movement that is calling for uh, a, a radical restructuring of our society, those are largely the base of this movement, the platform that Bernie Sanders is putting out, are youth. They're imagining a different world. We're imagining a different world, okay? And we have an opportunity to push for a different world. And so that's the role that we should assume. And we should take it on with seriousness and responsibility because it's, it, it, the stakes involved are whether people have food on their table, whether people are, have access to healthcare, whether people have access to employment, whether our struggle for justice is amplified and centered in every single struggle. You, another example is we also see that there tends to be differences between our generations and the generations that be come before us, okay? Youth play a critical role in pushing our generation, the older generations to think in a different way and approach our problems in a different way. We can think about this, for example, in the ways that the older generations who tend to be immigrants, first generation immigrants versus us, the youth and students who are born in the States. We're a little bit less hesitant to speak out on issues. We're not worried about, not all of us, obviously there's exceptions, especially recent young immigrants, but we're not worried about some of the ramifications and backlash that we would otherwise experience from that the older generations carry before them, with them. So for example, I can tell you an example of my dad. You know, my dad, when, when, my, when we first, when my parents first came, to this country, my dad and his family. Uh, there was a lot of hesitancy on their part to participate in any sort of political activity, to be at protests, to raise their head too high. If they got bullied in schools, keep your head down. We don't wanna, we don't wanna problems with immigration. We don't want problems with the state. My generation and our generation that were born here and our children that will be born here don't have those hesitations. We need to use the, the privilege that we have as citizens here in this country to push the boundaries of what is deemed um, safe or careful. We have the opportunity to be able to really forward our struggle and push for things. And I'll let Alex speak to the ways that, that that's done on student campuses. But when I was on a student on campus, we were disrupting events. We would go into events that Zionists were hold, that we knew they were whitewashing crimes against our people and we would disrupt them because we had nothing to fear and we had truth on our side. It's this sort of spirit that we carry with us that invigorates not just everyone around us, but our own communities and the older generations. It's this sort of fervor that we carry as youth and students that will advance our struggle. And so what I'll conclude with is this final point is, um, you as youth and students and those who aren't youth and students, the older generations, we need to invest in our youth. We need to support their work. We need to create programming, specially catered to them. Okay. And we need to give them a home. Palestinian institutions following Oslo dissolved. GUPS, the General Union of Palestinian Students, there are no longer chapters. Our task and our responsibility in one of the, the main visions of the PYM is to rebuild those institutions, to recreate the, these homes, just like PAC New Jersey is a home for your community. We need to have a home for every single Palestinian community in this country. Our youth need to be engaged and catered towards in those communities. And so for the older generations, I know you know this, the investment is in our youth. We need to invest in our youth with programming, supporting their work, uplifting their voices, providing them with opportunities to volunteer and things like that. And so really that they can carry the, the torch forward. Beyond that, there's so much to say about Palestinian youth and students organizing. There's so many successes, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it to Alex to talk about student work, to talk about the sort of activities that we engage in on campuses, and we'll conclude with some comments about the PYM. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Mohamed. Um, that was awesome. Yeah, I, I want to start this discussion by framing it on sort of like the history or the, the more recent history of Palestine organizing on campus. And um, I want to start it in 2003 with Wayne State University. So Wayne State University, it's in Michigan. It was the first university to pass divestment on their campus. Divestment being divestment from Israeli companies and um, institutions that the university is funneling money in that support the Zionist occupation of Palestine. And um, this is this was in 2003, and it's like pretty politically unprecedented for a couple of reasons, right? Number one, the official BDS call by the Palestinian Civil Society for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel didn't come until 2005. And their three points of unity platform did not come until two years after this um, divestment in 2003. But, but second, it's also politically unprecedented because in the history of the U Michigan University system, there were two divestments. One was divestment from apartheid South Africa in 1978. And the next one was um, in 1999 against big tobacco companies. Those are the only two divestments. And the university's policy, which it says on its website, is um, they will divest if something is, quote, is antithetical to the core missions of the University of Michigan system and therefore merit divestment. Um, and so I want to talk about the guidelines for divestment because they're not easy, you know, especially in a rigid system that that UMIS has described on their website. In order for divestment to proceed, the group of students, in our case, Students for Justice in Palestine, um, that are pushing this must meet these three guidelines. So number one, the concern to be explored must express the broadly and consistently held position of the campus and community over time. Um, number two, there must be a reason to believe that the behavior or action in question may be antithetical to the core mission and values of the university. And three, there must be reason to believe that the organization, industry, or entity to be singled out may be uniquely responsible for the problems identified. So in order to achieve this in the context of no previous divestments, in the Palestine solidarity sphere on campuses. Um, in the context of, like Muhammad said, a post-Oslo organizing sphere where the student movements of GUPS and these other institutions have sort of fallen, um, the work of the SJP chapter at Wayne State was intense. So the main things they did, like the three things they accomplished, and it was a testament to the hard work of the students, were number one, building sustainable relationships and coalitions and making Palestine a central topic for students. In order to push this BDS resolution, they had to make, they had to position Palestine in a way that it was specifically relevant for students on campus. And it is in a number of ways. You know, I, like this, I'm not the first one to say this, but Palestine for a lot of students is the, the doorway to a much bigger world of social justice issues for what Palestine represents. So with no political precedent, they were able to do this on their campus. And this is also a testament to how organically people gravitated towards the Palestinian cause for liberation, um, especially because repression isn't new and it's not innate to Palestine, nor is monetarily supporting institutions that support um, injustice, oppression, occupation, etc. So it's really significant that they were able to do this with, with such um, you know, with, with no real political history in the Palestine sphere behind it, this divestment. The second one is that the student movement very like systematically shifted the balance of powers. And when I say systematically, I mean, there was like a method to it. They were, they were you know, engaged with the campus voice, with the students. They were engaged with the professors. They were engaged with the administration. They were engaged with the community. They were systematically addressing these different spheres in order to push their cause. And I think that's really important to know, especially at an institution like Wayne State, where there is a minor in Israeli studies and a number of colleges, specifically noting the Liberal Arts College and the, the College of Sciences at, at Wayne State, have professors who specialize in programs that are connected to Israeli institutions. A number of research is done out of the Hebrew University and other stuff, making the institution, I mean, very deeply ingrained with Israeli academia. 
And if we understand university institutions to be a place for the expansion and diffusion of knowledge, then it's really significant when a Palestine solidarity organization that is run by students becomes the narrative, becomes the hub people are coming to to learn about Palestine and not the institution. When you have like an MSA, a Muslim Student Association, or another organization that are wanting to engage with Palestine, who are they going to? It's not the professors, it's, it's the student group. And I think that's, that's really a significant feat for the, the movement. And lastly, I, I, to just to this point specifically, I wanna really emphasize the role of building power in this. Because like Muhammad touched on, the role of students building powers, uh, the role of student building power in the movement is largely disruption. Yeah, like, for example, if I were like a school, an elementary school, right? And the teachers wanted to strike. If the teachers went on strike, then the students couldn't come to class. And because the students couldn't come to class, the parents would have to leave their work and take care of their students. So there's very tangible monetary impact. But the role of students isn't like that. The, the university institution does not, they don't really have any stakes in its internal function. So the fact that the students were able to do this, despite the fact that there was no stake in the internal functioning, is another testament to the role of disruption and how they were able to build power, which they did through, which they did so through sit-ins at the Board of Regents office, demonstrations on campus, etc. You know, and it was because of this effective use of student power that divestment um, at Wayne State was able to proceed, you know, and um, Wayne State set a really strong precedent for the student movement to follow. The tactics and strategies that were employed at Wayne State have been like sort of like the collective knowledge now of SJP chapters. It's written in books, it's written in pamphlets on how to divest. And if we look at the movement today, it's grown, I mean, tremendously. Today, there are over 250 student organizations dedicated to justice in Palestine across North America. Of them, 75 student organizations at these universities have successfully coordinated BDS campaigns um, on their campus. Um, and now to talk about sort of like the logistics and the specificities of SJPs, um, you know, these SJPs act individually and they, a lot of these students that gravitate to SJP are from the communities that they then attend college to. And as a result, I mean, they serve as like sort of a hub and a vehicle for progressive politics and political education both on campus and the community and this is a testament both to like the innate sort of internationalist character of of our work and of our struggle but also is a huge testament to the grassroots work of local sjps in their campuses and community and to just give a personal anecdote the University of Houston SJP has been, you know, sort of like a leader in progressive politics, both at a community and campus level. Uh, in regards to the former at, uh, at a campus level, you know, we're engaged in a, no, a number of coalitions uh, on a wide variety of social justice issues, um, as well as a number of, of organizations are involved in our campaigns and coalition. Additionally, before the emergence of PYM and this other, um, these other like Palestinian infrastructures in Houston, SJP was sort of like a door for community organizations also to get in contact with the Palestine organizing world. So like SJP Houston has a lot of contacts with churches in our area, with massages in our area, you know? Um, and then in terms of like the political side, we've been involved with workers striking at our university. We've, we've been involved with that. Uh, we, we're part of a coalition that was, you know, defending Kashmir and, and, uh, and we were part of like an NAACP silent museum. So SJPs, you know, invest a lot of time into their community and the student movement for Palestine builds grassroots power uh, by doing so. Um, and now, so that's sort of like at a local level. And despite the fact that these SJPs function autonomously, there is still national coordination. Um, so there's an organization, National SJP, and National SJP, National Students for Justice in Palestine, is composed of over 250 student groups within the Palestine Solidarity Network. Um, 
as a movement, they host annual conferences, develop a shared political agenda, and connect with the broader global movement for freedom, equality, and justice in Palestine. Um, National SJP does a lot of amazing programming. Um, just to name one of the many things, they hosted a conference, they host an annual conference where organizers can come to learn political education, different strategies, etc. But the conference in UCLA had over 500 student organizers from across North America, which again is amazing. And at a national level, they've also been able to engage with transnational movement work with students in the Blad in Palestine. We've, we've done, um, in our past years, right to education. With two, with, so students from Birzeit University would come to the States and talk about life under occupation. And just recently, National SJP and the Palestinian Youth Movement hosted a joint webinar series with right to education and students. So at a national level, there's also organizing with students uh, back home. Um, and, but at a national level, we can also see the level of backlash that students face, you know, and this is through a number of things, through smear campaigns, blacklist websites, universities revoking funding. Um, and that's, you know, sort of at like a localized level, but at a national level, there are anti-BDS laws that affect 25 um, different states that essentially prevent any like university institution or institutions that work like that are sort of like local governance um, to contract with any business or person that does not relinquish their right to boycott Israel. And of course, this particularly affects students and their ability to access different speakers, different um, sources of knowledge to come to campus. Um, there was also in um, the end of 2019, Trump's redefining of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel, which now there are six court cases of them being at Rutgers University, New York, and Columbia University um, against, their, against their universities for their S, the SJP presence on their campus. So at a local and national level, there is you know, ample backlash. But at the end of the day, that's only a testament to the tenacity of student organizers. Um, I can talk at a national level and then at my local level at SJP. At a national level, National Students for Justice in Palestine created this sort of like ad hoc movement called SJP Unite, which got over 105 Students for Justice in Palestine chapters, not only in North America, but in South Africa and Germany, to sign on to a statement explicitly condemning uh, Trump's executive order. Uh, this statement was amplified by Jewish Voice for Peace, by the Institute for Middle East Understanding, by the Palestinian Youth Movement. Uh, and through that, we were able to host a webinar where over 50 SJP chapters attended, where we were able to have the one-on-one -on, -one on how to message, how to handle this backlash, to get actual feedback from students on where they're at in their campus context, and to teach them skills of power mapping. So they're able to effectively maneuver their campus and, and organize and, and you know, sustain their movement work. Now, at a local level, in regards to like the anti-BDS clause, um, at the University of Houston, we engage in a, in a coalition campaign, Defend Our Voice, um, which galvanized thousands of signatures uh, and had numerous events in educating the campus and pressuring the administration to come out against the, the BDS law, the anti-BDS law. Um, and we were able to engage with somewhere between 10 to 15 student organizations that sort of organically came together and very actively participated um, in this work. Um, so yeah, so the student movement, despite the backlash and, and is like creating the conditions they need or creating the context and creating the precedent for Palestine political organization as we move forward. And so just to conclude this, I know I just like yelled for 20 minutes, but to conclude this, we need to give the student movement legitimacy because their tenacity and their access to power and their creativity and their ability to mobilize numerous sectors with little burnout because we're students and you know, kind of we have energy um, is really important. You know, and I think of like Brown University 
where maybe an elite institution, where maybe five years ago was di investing in Israeli companies, now not only voted on divestment, but has a chair for the Mahmoud Darwish chair for Palestine studies at Brown. Um, so uh, to conclude, support the student movement and free Palestine. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Muhammad and Alex. That was super, very, very enlightening. I think, you know, I, many times our communities forget um, that the youth are the secret. Uh, luckily at PAC and in our community, there's a lot of investment in the youth. Um, I would love to see exactly what you're saying, something at a national level where there's a huge investment in youth. And I think we can kind of maybe talk about how PAC Houston and PAC New Jersey can focus on this. And, and I even, you know, I remember one of our conversations was talking about having a, PI, a PYM chapter in New Jersey. We would love that. Um, so now we're gonna open it up to questions. Uh, we already received two and we ask everyone else to please uh, put in your questions in the chat box and we're going to be going in the order they're received. Um, so the first question is from Nafiz where she says um, she sees the importance of community engagement. What if your community is not open to engaging with our message, which is a very important question. So I can take that uh, question. I, I, at the end of the day, the the primary um, vehicle for community engagement isn't just a political message. Um, it's about engaging them on the basis of relationships. Like the first thing that you have to do is you have to form relationships with your community. You have to engage them on issues that they are comfortable engaging on. The Palestinian communities across the U.S. and across North America, really across the globe, have different relationships to politics and advocacy and activism. Some communities are really sheltered and guarded and scared from participating. And some communities are on the forefront of mobilizing their members to engage in a protest. The actual building out of that work takes time. It takes forging relationships. There are people that are present in your community that are interested, you start on a small level building with one-on-one -on -one, and the group becomes five people. At the University of Texas at Austin, I'm just gonna give this brief story just to give an example. When I first started, I, 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 there was a, 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 I remember going to a meeting for the Palestine Solidarity Committee, which is our SJP, and it had four people at the meeting. I'm not joking. One of them was Palestinian. The other three, the, me being the Palestinian, the other three weren't Palestinian. By my third year, we had 65 members. The leadership was almost entirely Palestinian. We were carrying divestment campaigns, doing protests, but it started at that four person meeting. And so this, this sort of work, especially in the community takes time. It's very slow. You build it meticulously. You engage in programming that's a little less controversial, like cultural programming. Nobody's gonna say no to Dabke. Nobody's gonna say no to Knafe. Nobody's gonna say no to Shawarma or Hamur. Meet people where they're at, move them beyond that. Then you start doing a film screening. Then you start doing whatever it is. But the truth is our communities, the Palestinian communities in North America, the Palestinian communities in the diaspora have uh, a flame inside them. Every single Palestinian in the diaspora has a flame inside them. And their children are past that flame. And that flame is burning. Sometimes it's burning high and loud and you can see it and you can see it in the voice and you can see it in their mannerisms and you can see them at protests. And sometimes they're very faint. But when the war in Gaza happens, you see that flame burning high. Our goal and our responsibility as organizers, especially youth organizers, is to build that flame, is to activate it, is to re-engage our communities. And it's done slowly and it's done meticulously and it's meeting them where they're at. It's not about shaming them. It's not about guilting them. It's not saying, look, what have you done for our struggle lately? But it's still about, it's about inviting them. And in inviting them, it's, based, it's predicated on building relationships, them knowing your name, them seeing your face. And that's, you take it from there. I love that. Thank you so much, Muhammad. I think building the flame and igniting the flame is a beautiful, beautiful way to put it. And it's something that we have to keep in mind and constantly work towards. 
Um, Sufyan has the question where he says, thank you both for your time and efforts. Uh, with many organizations, both previous, re previously established and newly developed, do you see an issue with being able to bring Palestinians together? For example, you have SJP, AMP, PCRF, et cetera. What I commonly see is each organization has its audience, but when mentioning a collaboration or joint effort, it becomes a weird vibe. Good question. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can take this question too, Alex. And I'll, I'll, I, there's a question coming up on students in pro-Israel groups, so I'll leave that to you. Um, yeah, no, this is definitely a problem. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, our history. So let's tell a brief story about PYM. One of the reasons that PYM became an organization, it actually originated um, out of the 2006, uh, 2007 civil war between Hamas and Fatah. Um, uh, and this marked, uh, a moment of deep fragmentation for our people. It was a moment where Palestinians were killing each other, um, which has happened historically in the past, but it represents uh, our conditions as Palestinians under colonization. Because we're divided geographically and politically, it's very hard to bring us together. You know, we're divided geographically. We have Palestinians in the refugee camps who can't leave. You have Palestinians in Gaza who've never left Gaza. You have Palestinians in 48 who, have, who struggle with their identity and their place in living in a state that sees them as a second-class citizen but affords them privileges like accessing the shore that Palestinians in the West Bank don't have. Or you have Jerusalem Palestinians who live with their occupiers. Or you have Palestinians in the diaspora who have identity issues and don't know whether to call themselves Palestinian or not or whatever. So we're, we have a, this is what colonialism and Zionism has done to us. It's recognizing that, admitting it, and then saying, well, what is the basis for our unity? What do we do agree on? And the same, this is the same that can be extended to our organizations here in the, in the West, in the diaspora. Moments like this of PAC New Jersey reaching out to PYM or collaborating with PAC Houston, it's slow. It's built out very slowly. There have been attempts to bring Palestinian organizations together before. It's failed. But we need to keep at it because the fate of Palestine depends on it. We're not gonna free Palestine if we're not uni united. And unity isn't just a slogan, unity is a process. And that process requires time, it requires commitment to principles and values, not just power, because you have that sometimes, people are very territorial and guarded and don't wanna give other people space because they think that means it's taking away from them. Uh, for PYM, our pledge is towards building towards unity that's predicated on values and principles. Things like the right of return is non-negotiable. No one can forfeit our right to return. No, no one can forfeit our right to access the shores of Palestine. No one can forfeit the, our responsibilities towards our people in the camps in Lebanon who are suffering as second-class citizens for decades. No one can sell that away. So if we agree as Palestinians globally and collectively that, that those are our principles, we build on the basis of those principles. We don't build on the basis of who has access to decision making or, or who gets to control this event or who gets to control the message. The message is this is non-negotiable and we build beyond that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's the beauty of the youth is I feel more and more that is the mentality that's developing and it really is united we will prosper divided will fall so it's it we need to keep that in mind and we need to keep working towards finding different ways of unity finding that common ground and remembering that liberation is the end goal and we can agree to disagree on how we're going to get there but we have to keep the end goal in mind so thank you for that beautiful reminder um so our next question is from Mona. Uh, who asks how do you deal with clashes with pro-israel groups on campus and in your community Oh, yeah, so by respond, um, I wouldn't, because I don't think that these like attacks or like these verbal um, things to try and instigate a conversation are genuine. These Israeli groups don't want a conversation. These Israeli groups don't want dialogue. And, uh, and if a clash does break out, like if you're having like an IAW week or if you're at a meeting, and, and an Israeli group, um, you know, starts to say, oh, well, this happened, this happened, blah, blah, blah. If, if you do decide to engage in front of an audience, it's not a matter of responding to their claims, it's a matter of maintaining your narrative. 
because they, they what there's no dialogue between the a group defending the colonization of our homeland and those struggling for its liberation. That dialogue doesn't exist. But what exists is our narrative, and what exists is maintaining and staying strong in the narrative that we've been pushing, which is, you know, in 1948, we were ethnically cleansed from our homeland. There is a brutal occupation that denies us access to water and education and movement. And there's no response or argument to that. But maintaining your narrative um, is the strongest option to do if there is like an Israeli group making an accusation or making a claim. Um, and if there's like, uh, like, uh, let's say like your your SSI or your Hillel on your campus is doing like um, like um, like okay for for example at the University of Houston the Hillel group did they showed the film Son of Hamas um, I don't know if y'all have heard of that but it's awful it's incredibly Islamophobic um, and so we have to be strategic about how we engage we have to see okay how big is this event what are the stakes of, of a disruption and like plan accordingly. So what we did is we literally, we literally like went through the movie, pointed out all the Islamophobia, all the, all the misinformation, and we posted it on top of their flyers around campus. That way we were making sure that our narrative was still being the, at the forefront as opposed to engaging them and say, oh, you're having this event, but we want to say why this is wrong, why you shouldn't say that, you know, Islam is the problem. Like, that, that's not a conversation. You know, there's no conversation with Islamophobia or that sort of uh, pushback. I just want to add a quick point to something that Alex is saying. I think our audience and our target isn't the Zionist groups. That's uh, important. Our audience and target is everyone else. And everyone, you build on that basis. And so if it's worth your time to confront Zionist groups for everyone else's sake, you do it. If it's not worth your time, if you're one-on-one, -on -one, there's no point in having a conversation because it's not about convincing that other person. And so for, uh, for you, like Alex said, maintaining our narrative, but also honing in on who your audience is, building with other groups. When you build with the Black Student Organization, with the Latino Student Organization, with the MSA on campus, the Zionist groups will isolate themselves. They cannot because they they don't have a positive message they're not calling for justice for uh, israel they're calling for lack of justice for palestinians and that doesn't resonate with other groups we're the ones who have a positive message we're the ones who are claiming affirmatively what we believe and what we don't believe they their only role and reason they exist on campus is to oppose us that's their only role so you build with everyone else and don't give them a re don't give them a basis for opposition by engaging them. Thank you guys. So um, I, I'm gonna ask the last question of the evening. Um, building on that point and with everything in the current events that are happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything else, what is P PYM's role in solidarity? And in general, what is the role of solidarity specifically with the youth? How can you get them engaged? How can you get them excited? And how can you explain the importance of it? Um, yeah, so I, I think pa our, our struggle is predicated on a number of principles. Um, it's one of them is justice. Um, the other is liberation. Um, we believe in a number of things for our people. Our, our people have always been at the forefront of reaching out to other struggles. You know, at the height of our revolution, what we call the Palestinian revolution, Palestinians were engaged with anti-colonial movements in Ireland and South Africa. In, um, in Angola, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America. That is, the, that is the tradition of the Palestinian movement, is internationalism, is solidarity, is recognizing the shared principles and the shared enemies that we have. Not only do we value the same things, the same people wanna put us down. The same systems wanna put us down. They use the same tear gas, they use the same rubber-coated bullets. They, do, they use the same tactics and techniques. We see this in drawing on the commonalities between the Israeli training of police. Our responsibility is to fight against the system. That system is oppressing people here. If you want people to fight the system that's oppressing Palestinians, well, you fight it on the basis that it oppresses them too. 
And that's how we reach out across lines. Nothing makes our struggle more successful and more principled and advances us better than supporting the struggles of other people who are under oppression. When we were at, we were at a, we organized a contingent in Houston that involved the PAC, PYM and SJP at UH to go to um, the George Floyd protest that occurred on um, this past weekend. And we had a banner that says Palestinians for Black Liberation. And I cannot begin to describe the amount of outpouring of support we received from our Black brothers and sisters who were at the protests, who would chant things like free Palestine on us, but we weren't trying to make it about Palestine. But they did it because they recognized that we were there in support of them. People would stop with us, stop and talk to us and ask us questions. I had a, a, a member of a black church, a congregation of a member of a black church stop to talk to me and he said, I've heard so much about Palestine, but I really don't know what to believe. And he was like, can you tell me like what's going on a little bit? And so I, I briefly talked to him, but what I stressed is the, the principle of internationalism that our, our movement has carried, the fact that we've supported the black struggle historically. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. This man, I met him for the first time and within a, a minute of talking to him, he started crying. And he was crying because he, he was sympathetic for our struggle and our issues, but he was crying because of the emotions he felt from being there for his struggle and feeling the connection with mine and ours. So our, the role of youth, the Build Coalition on campus, to push our community to participate. Our communities have a lot of issue on the black, black struggle. There are, we support it, but there are those who don't, okay? We have to struggle amongst them. We have to struggle with care and respect and patience, not with canceling and call out. That's not how it's gonna get done. We gotta move our people slowly and convince them on the basis that they should support these things. Um, so definitely 100% PYM believes jo joint struggle is an entire front for us. We believe, and we call it joint struggle because we are not allies of these movements. We are in struggle with them. And that's how we see it. And that's how Palestinian youth should see it as well um, um, in terms of how they view other struggles. Absolutely. I love that, that, you know, it's, it's our joint struggle and that's the reality. It's our joint struggle to a better world free of oppression and a world filled with justice. Um, I want to thank you both very much for this very enlightening talk. I'm walking away from this very inspired and having a lot of different ideas and trying to figure out different ways we can collaborate. I want to give you both a, a chance to give any final words to talk a little bit about PYM before we close it off for the night. Okay, I'll just be brief because uh, I'm passing the mic to Alex, but I, 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 on my screen, I shared a page that kind of demonstrates um, the different things that we do. Um, on the left corner, you see we, we try to organize. We organize with the family of the Holy Land Five. If you don't know about the Holy Land Five, uh, 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 members of our community who were uh, imprisoned um, uh, on an illegitimate basis are serving multiple decades of prison time. One of the members of the Holy Land Five is actually from Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, Abdurrahman Oud is from Patterson, New Jersey. I think some of the ways that the government repressed the members of the Holy Land Five started in Patterson, New Jersey, actually, and the surveillance of the Palestinian community there. So I just wanted to flag that. Uh, in the left corner, you see some of our work around, well, this is a delegation of Palestinian organizers we took to South Africa to study the South African experience around apartheid and to learn from our brothers and sisters in South Africa about how to overcome apartheid. And really the, what we studied is the, the difficulties that they continue to face, even with the fall of political apartheid, there's still economic apartheid. COVID community response work like um, uh, PAC New Jersey is doing, there's a protest on the far right corner. This is the summer school in the middle. Every two years we host a summer school where we bring Palestinian Arab youth together to, do a, to engage in political education and skills training and things like that. We uh, open it up. Um, we'll be sure to share it with your audience as well, Pac New Jersey, and then obviously the Hassan Kanafani Scholarship. This is just some of our work. Please, uh, you can see our information, pymusa.com. If you're interested in becoming a member, there's actually a, a, on the pymusa.com, there's a way for you to submit an inquiry. We'll send you an application. I'll probably the, be the one who ends up talking to you if you do apply. Uh, we would love to have you, no matter where you're at, 
I know some of these spaces and areas can be intimidating, but we're welcoming, we're inviting, and we, we, we will bring you in and, and, and hopefully help support you. We'll be supported by you and we'll support you as well. Uh, uh, thank you again, PAC New Jersey. Rania, thank you so much. Uh, I love uh, being here. I, I love talking to you all and I'm excited to build on this in the future and I'll pass it to Alex. Yeah. Um... Thank you for having us. Uh, really appreciate that. I want to also plug if you're interested in getting plugged in with the with the National Students for Justice and Palestine movement. Um, I don't have a slide, but I can type it in the chat. It's National SJP on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and we're we're planning for programming, of course, accommodating to an online um, space due to COVID-19, but so check out for like the different opportunities to attend our online and national SJP conference. Um, in the fall semester, we have a resource library if you're a local chapter is interested in getting more information. Um, and we're really looking to connect with local chapters as well. So that's National SJP on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you very much, Mohammed and Alex. And I'm hoping this is the beginning of different collaboration and works that we can do together, again, to make a better future for everyone. Um, so thank you very much. We hope this is not the first or not the last time we will see you. And we hope you know we're gonna continue this collaboration in many ways. Um, so please, everyone, make sure to take the census at your earliest convenience. And we challenge you all to get five other people to take the census as well. These webinars are brought to you by PAC. Don't forget to see a full list of all of our upcoming events and to donate to keep these programmings going, going, please visit www.pacusa.org. We hope to see you in our future webinars. I want to remind you that next week we are scheduled to have Suzanne Abul Hawa and the following week we're scheduled to have Anarwa. If you liked anything you saw, please support and donate what you can at www.pacusa.org. And with that, I hope everybody has a wonderful night. I want to thank Muhammad and Alex and Palestinian, Palestinian Youth Movement and the National SJP Movement once again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rania. Take care, everyone.